Hi guys, I want to give you a quick rundown of some key findings from a previously published meta-analysis that Johannes Karl and I uh, conducted. We were interested in understanding the factors that explain why people do or do not follow um, behavioral guidelines that are limiting the spread of the virus and, and help protect others. The problem with uh, a pandemic like uh, COVID is that behavior is key. We have to understand uh, what motivates behavior, what are the factors that uh, make people more willing to engage in those behaviors that protect them, but also others. So going back right to the beginning of the pandemic, the best option to help people be safe was to stay home, you know, stay at home, lock down, uh, shelter in place, because that helps to limit the spread of the virus and so saves lives in the long run. And even today with the vaccine uh, now being available, the major issue at this moment is to get people motivated get people to to get the shot and and get vaccinated because without a sufficient number of people being vaccinated the there is a continuing risk about uh, the transmission of the virus and further fatalities so we need to understand what motivates people to either follow or not follow these guidelines or become vaccinated or not so one of the best uh, psychological approaches, psychological theories that we have is the theory of plant behavior. And it has been incredibly useful for understanding health behavior and all sorts of other behaviors around the world. So here's a, a screenshot um, from a couple of days ago about, you know, like the search numbers that you can find on, on Google. It's incredible how many studies and have used that theory. So it's a well-supported theory uh, that has been used in a lot of different contexts. So what are the components? First of all, uh, the theory of plant behavior assumes that intentions lead to behavior. So an important aspect of it is to study intentions to uh, perform a certain behavior. And then the question is what factors influence intentions? So first of all, we have attitudes. So do people uh, like doing something? Do they have a positive attitude towards something? The second one are the second component are subjective norms. So what do people think others think of this? So the the social norms around it and the extent to which people um, perceive that others are favorably inclined to do something. And the third component is self-efficacy. So whether people have the feeling that they can do it, they have the right skill sets to actually perform the behavior, so perceived behavioral control. So these three components are really important for influencing intentions and then influence behaviors. And there's lots of research showing that if we start, you know, like uh, providing or incentivizing more positive attitudes, um, increase subjective, positive subjective norms, or give people the skills to perform the behavior, then people are more likely to actually follow guidelines and do um, and uh, perform the behavior that is beneficial for them and for their community. The interesting question though is which is which of these is the best predictor? So here is um, a study, um, it's in preparation from our group, uh, where we basically pulled all the evidence um, using theory of plant behavior research together. And it clearly shows that attitudes typically have the strongest correlation with intentions and also with behaviors, followed by perceived behavioral control. So this suggests that um, based on the available literature, the best options to get people to perform these actions is to increase the positive perception of these actions. So, you know, like inducing more positive attitudes and helping people to feel more competent and, and giving them the skill sets to perform the behaviors, so perceived behavioral control. Interestingly, subjective norms do relate to intentions and also behaviors, but the effect in past research is much uh, weaker and some people have even argued that you should potentially drop um, social norms, subjective norms from the model because it doesn't actually predict as much as attitudes and perceived behavioral control. But the issue is uh, a pandemic and, and COVID-19 specifically may actually 
operate slightly differently. So we have to look also for moderators. Um, one of the first things that seems to be really important if we look or when we look around the world is that, you know, like these norms and, and the endorsement and the support that people have for, you know, like following uh, these, these behavioral guidelines varies dramatically from location to location. So we have some contexts, some nations where leaders stood up and forced very clear guidelines, set good examples, and there was strong support for these actions uh, in the wider public. In another context, leaders actually undermined uh, activities from, from their scientists, from their health professionals. And so, you know, like there were very unclear, uh, you know, like rules, guidelines. And, and so therefore there was much more muddled set of um, perceptions of, of the norms. So a first question really is uh, that we are trying to ask, could it be that, you know, like the level of the subjective norm support in a population helps to strengthen the subjective norm effects uh, at the individual level. So it's it's an interaction between, you know, like whether somebody thinks that others support uh, a behavior and then also the, you know, like in the aggregate, in the population, people actually do hold those uh, ideas as well or, you know, like support these ideas. A second important moderator from past research on the theory of planned behavior is individualism and collectivism. Both at the individual level as well as at the nation level, there is evidence that individuals who are more individualistic, so uh, and a person that has more individualistic values and beliefs, uh, typically shows stronger intentions if the attitudes uh, are positive. So individualism seems to strengthen attitude effects within the theory of plant behavior and vice versa. Uh, subjective norm effects seem to be stronger for individuals that, that have more collectivistic values and beliefs and also in more collectivistic settings um, subjective norm effects seem to be stronger. So that would be an obvious moderator to look into here as well. And that is particularly relevant because a recently published study showed that collectivism predicts mask use around COVID both across different states in the US as well as globally. A third predictor, um, and quite relevant in the current context, is tightness looseness. So the work by Michelle Gelfand and others has demonstrated that tightness looseness is a very important predictor that helps us understand when people will follow uh, norms. And, you know, like we, we have a better understanding in what conditions, ecological conditions, uh, these kind of uh, norms become more crystallized and, and are better than to actually guide behavior. And one of the recent studies by uh, Gelfin's team as well has shown that tightness looseness is actually a good predictor of both COVID cases as well as COVID mortality. So another obvious predictor uh, to see, you know, like how it may influence the performance of the theory of plant behavior. And the third one is wealth. So on one hand, wealth has been shown to empower individuals, to help them um, transform their personal attitudes, beliefs, um, desires into behavior. So on the left hand side here, we have the classic, um, you know, like um, postmodern postmodernization um, explanation. So, you know, people starting from Ronald, Ingle, Ronald Inglehart's work showing that increased wealth helps people to become more emancipated, helps them to express their attitudes and, and their, you know, like, for example, their self-efficacy self -efficacy, uh, directly in behavior. So we could expect a strengthening of attitude and perceived behavioral control effects in more economically advanced societies. On the other hand, though, on the right hand side, um, I show some correlations between the average wealth within a society and COVID cases across different stages of the pandemic. So in March, in October last year, as well as in June uh, this year, what we can see is actually in more economically uh, advanced and so richer societies, there are more cases per capita, which, you know, like some people have argued, it's, it's somewhat counterintuitive, uh, but people have argued um, that potentially 
it leads to some, to some kind of complacency or, you know, like false sense of security because people have access to resources. They think like, uh, it's not going to affect me. Uh, if I get sick, I just go to the hospital or I, I have a health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's why health in the current pandemic context actually may have this counterintuitive uh, effect, which goes contrary to previous research. So our approach really is to take all these ideas and test them and see, you know, like, how can we actually use psychological theory to make better predictions of who will or will not follow behavioral guidelines. So we did a literature search. It was actually incredible. Within this, um, the span of a year, uh, the amount of research that has been published on, on, on this issue is incredible. And so I, I think that's a, actually a really good sign of the robustness of the scientific process. So we searched PsychInfo and PubMed, so already published studies, and also the gray literature via Google Scholar and SciArchive. And yeah, to show just, you know, like the incredible amount of research that has gone into this, we were able, in the span of less than a year, we were able to identify 83 uh, manuscripts based on 101 samples uh, totaling uh, uh, 355 effect sizes. That's an incredible amount of work that has gone into it and allows us to pull all this information together. And it, it's basically research that has been conducted in 31 countries, an incredible uh, scientific effort. And here, as you can see, uh, is the distribution of countries. Obviously, uh, slightly more research has been conducted in, in uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia because the pandemic started there, so people were exposed earlier. But as you can see also, uh, the US and UK have contributed a lot to this research effort. So how did we go about this? We uh, pulled all the correlation correlations between attitudes, intentions, attitudes, behaviors, etc., etc. In case that people reported regressions, we used the regression coefficients and transformed them into uh, correlation coefficients. Uh, we analyzed it in three different ways using a fixed effects model, a random effects model, and also a multi-level model. The reason why we also used uh, fixed effects models is because there the samples were often quite uneven. So we had some samples with relatively few participants and some very large samples. Uh, this can introduce some bias and sometimes random effects uh, analyses can actually lead to some somewhat uh, biased conclusions. So that's why we report all three uh, sites, uh, all three types of analyses. And we used R. Uh, all our code and all our data is on the OSF. And yeah, we used these three packages here. Highly recommended, really useful for conducting meta analyses. So, first of all, what is the relative strength of these different components within the theory? Uh, as you can see here, attitudes attitudes continue to show uh, some of the strongest correlations with both intentions and behaviors, followed by perceived behavioral control. So that is somewhat similar to previous research, but the subjective norm effects are actually uh, much stronger than in previous research and in some cases are not distinguishable from the effects of perceived behavioral control and attitude. So which suggests that in the context of the pandemic, norm effects are actually important and we have to look into them. So are there norm effects? Yes, there are. And do we actually find these um, these interaction effects with population levels? Yes, we do. Um, so in a, in a context where uh, people hold subjective norms that, you know, like others will actually uh, support this action. And then in that population, there is in fact a strong support for that we see a stronger subjective norm effect. And an interesting observation, and this is the cool thing about doing meta-analysis, it also allows us to break down where is the variability. Is it at the level of the individual, at the level of the population, this is the local sample, or at the nation level? And as we can see here, table three on the right, uh, we can see a very clear effect that uh, subjective norm effects seem to be uh, at the level of the sample, so at the local population level. So really there's something going on at the local population level. And this is actually, if you think about interventions, subjective norms need to be fostered at the local level um, in order to induce positive action. The next question here, 
Are there individualism and collectivism effects? Yes, they are. Interestingly, the effects are in line with previous research for subjective norms. So this is what you see here, both the intentions and the behaviors. But then on the other hand, we also see strong collectivism effects across the board. So contrary to previous research that suggested individualism strengthens attitude effects, what we actually find is that collectivism strengthens both attitude effects and perceived behavioral control effects, which suggests it's actually um, a collective action problem. You know, like people have to work together in order to protect themselves and protect others. So that's, you know, like one of those examples where, you know, like previous research is good, but, you know, like it may not capture some of the uh, specific dynamics within uh, a context like a pandemic. Furthermore, are the tightness looseness effects in line with the theory, uh, so supporting uh, Michelle Gelfand's work, uh, in tighter contexts, we see a strengthened subjective norm effect. So that again seems to support previous research around subjective norms and tightness looseness. And finally, are there wealth effects? And in which direction do they go? Uh, do they support previous uh, theorizing about the empowering notion of wealth? Or do they uh, support this notion of more kind of uh, this false sense of security? And it seems Actually, wealth across the board limits the ability of the theory of plant behavior to um, predict intentions and positive behaviors. So it seems to support this notion of a full sense of security in higher income contexts. So what are the key points to take away from this? First of all, the theory of plant behavior psychological research is useful. It can help us identify what variables are important to consider for, for example, health communication research and under what circumstances do these theories work well or work better compared to others. So really important, we need to draw on previous psychological research uh, to help us, you know, develop better um, behavioral interventions, specifically right now when we try and motivate people to take uh, the vaccines. But also the same thing um, on, on the other side of the coin, we also see that the pandemic related response is not necessarily always the same as typical health behavior. So the pandemic actually has collective action properties which uh, shift some of these effects. Yeah? And that's important again to also very clearly monitor and, and carefully monitor and then take appropriate actions here. The further important message here is norm effects do matter. So some people have downplayed uh, norm effects within the theory of plant behavior. Norms do matter, especially within a pandemic. This also means with uh, the finding that we um, that we had in terms of the population level subjective norm effects, you know, at the local level, you know, in the real world, we need to set and reinforce strong norms. So leaders have a very important role to play here and need to set appropriate behavioral guidelines and then uh, follow them and also reinforce them. And then at a theoretical level, obviously, all of us who work on, on norm effects, you know, like norms do matter and we need to spend more time uh, not just focusing on attitudes and beha perceived behavioral control and all these other individual level attitudes, but we need to uh, spend more time understanding how norms actually work in specific contexts. And the interesting thing, collectivism effects were contrary to some of the previous research, which suggests that actually behavior in the context of the pandemic had showed these collective action properties, similar to uh, what some of the authors in, um, in a special issue that came out very early on in the British Journal of Social Psychology had argued that we need to actually study these collective action properties of behavior in the context of a pandemic. And uh, finally, wealth effects do matter, but they may actually induce this false sense of confidence and security. And we have to be very careful. We have to spend actually more effort in, you know, like more well-off context to help people um, behave uh, accordingly and to protect themselves and protect others. So these are some of the key points. Uh, as I said, all the material is on the OSF. The paper is freely available. It's down here in the chat. So check it out. And we are always uh, keen to hear from you, hear your thoughts, feedback, and work together to use science to help our public be safe. All right. Thank you very much and see you soon.